Good morning. Oh, no. Good afternoon, church. I didn't realize how many pages I had. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> so, the title of my sermon is The Girl Who Became Queen. I'm going to give a little historical background before we get into the chapter, of, into the book of Esther. The kingdom of Babylon reigned from 606 to 539 BC. During this time, King Nebuchadnezzar II took many Jews from the city of Jerusalem and held them in captivity for more than half a century. Later, King Cyrus the Great conquers Babylon, which caused the kingdom of Babylon to fall. Then the kingdom of Media Persia arose in 539 BC and ruled for 208 years. Many Judeans were free to return to Jerusalem while others decided to stay. Now in the book of Esther, the king ruling at the time was the Persian king Xerxes. He was not a Jew and his predecessors were not Jews either and neither were the people of Media Persia. So the question is, how did Esther, a godly woman, navigate her way through an ungodly world? Let us pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you help me to relay the message that you want me to say unto others, Lord, and even unto myself. I pray for the conviction of the Holy Spirit as we navigate through this sermon together, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So... Alongside praying during the sermon, I also advise that you follow me in the book of Esther as we'll be going from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 10. And I also advise that you take notes along the way. So chapter 1, let's read the first four verses together. I have a lot of verses along the way, so I will say them myself to save time. So chapter 1, verse 1. Now it, come, now it came to pass in the days of Xerxes. This was Xerxes who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days when King Xerxes sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, that in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his officials and servants. The powers of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all. So after this time period, King Xerxes held a feast that lasted seven days. And at the same time, Queen Vashti was also holding a royal banquet for the women. In his drunken state, the king asked for his eunuchs to bring the queen before him to show off her beauty to everyone, but she refuses. This makes the king furious, resulting in him consulting with his wise men on how to deal with the matter. Since they did not want her bad conduct to influence other women, they advised the king to one, kick her out and find another woman who is better to take her place, and two, to make a law that cannot be repealed for all the provinces reinforcing the idea of the man being the leader of the home. The king takes the advice, and now the position of a queen is needed to be filled. As chapter 2. In Esther 2, verse 16, it indicates a four-year span between chapter 1 and chapter 2, and it also gives context as to how long the king was without a queen. Because in the first chapter, it mentions that it was in his third year, year of reigning when this happened. And of course, now it's four years later where he's in his seventh year reign. His advisors advised to hold a beauty contest where a beautiful virgin woman should first win in their local beauty contest, and then their finalist will be brought to the city of Shushan or Susa to the palace. This is where the character of Esther's first introduced alongside what her relationship is like with her cousin Mordecai. So we all know, or also for those who may not know, her Hebrew name was Hadassah, which means a myrtle tree, and it is associated with peace, love, and prosperity. 
It is then changed to Esther, which was used to hide her identity, which means star. So we're first told that Esther is said to be fair and beautiful, lovely, and there's other versions that say lovely figure and beautiful. In Hebrew, lovely and beautiful means beautiful in form and lovely to look at. When the Bible talks about a person's looks, we know that it is relevant to the story and it is not exaggerating. Two, she had made a good impression on the eunuch Hegai, who was in charge of the beauty preparations. This shows that she was not just beautiful on the, in, on the outside, but she was also beautiful on the inside. This could also be interpreted as her godliness shining through her. This earned her special beauty preparations and an extra seven choice maidservants to look after her beauty needs. Three, she was humble and confident in who she was already before her beauty preparations had even begun. Before she and the other women were brought before the king, they were allowed to bring extra things to help them impress the king further. But Esther decided to bring nothing and instead let the custodian of the women assist her preparations. This helped Esther gain favor in the eyes of all who all who saw her, which further proves her how beautiful and godly she was in her heart. Four, <laughs> she is a Jew and an orphan, but was then raised by Mordecai, her cousin. But she could not reveal her identity to anyone yet as Mordecai had ordered her to. On one hand, it can be argued that she had made a poor choice to conceal who she truly was as God calls us to be proud of our identity as Christians. But on the other hand, it can be seen as, as waiting on God for the right moment to reveal it, to carry out his plan. And this is what Mordecai felt was the right thing to do. So Esther agreed. This indicates that she had a close, loving relationship with Mordecai, that she had a lot, a lot of respect for him, that she trusted his judgment, and that Mordecai cared for her so much as well. Finally, Esther obtains grace and favor from the king out of all the women. Other versions say he was attracted to her. The clear word Bible says he was immediately attracted to her, resulting in her becoming queen of King Xerxes. Now that she was in a position of power, she decided to put in the good word to the king about Mordecai, which led to him to be able to sit within the king's gate, which meant he could make decisions and be a man of influence for the kingdom. She also gave him the credit when she reported to the king that his life was in, was in danger, resulting in the king later rewarding him. We can see her already using her power for good and not leaving any family members behind which further shows how humble, loving, and kind nature she was. Psalms 75, verse 6 to 9. For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. This verse verifies that Esther did not, did not just assume the role of the queen, but just because of luck or because of her good looks, but it was rather to fulfill God's plan of which Esther was included. This chapter also demonstrates that God can take an evil action and turn it into good. King Xerxes becoming drunk to eventually kicking out his queen was probably not in the plan that God had in mind, but it still gave way to God's plan to make Esther queen. Chapter 3, and this is where we are introduced to the villain of the story, Haman the Agagite. He was an ungodly man who had just been promoted to a seat higher than all the princes of whom he was with before, which is a prime minister in today's context. During the ceremony introduction of his promotion, all the king's servants bowed to him except one person, who was Mordecai. Each day, Mordecai is asked why he would not bow, and that's when he reveals that, reveals that he is a Jew. The king's the servants tell Haman, and this makes him furious. He wants to punish Mordecai, but he thought that that wouldn't be enough. So instead, he takes out his wrath upon all the Jews in the kingdom. He first casts pur, which is a Persian word for, for the word lot, or in other words, a dice. And it was thrown on the first month of the year, and it fell on the 13th month of Adar, which was the 12th month of that year. 
This fulfills the truth in Proverbs 16, verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. This means it was intentional that there was a long delay between the first and the last month of the massacre of the Jews as it was ordained by God. Then Haman goes to tell the king his plan and says, there are people within the kingdom who have customs referring to the Jews that go against the king's laws. Therefore, they should be killed. Whoever carries this out will be paid 10,000 talents of silver, which is coming from the property of the slaughtered Jews, not Haman's pockets. The king agreed and gave Haman the signet ring and advised Haman to do whatever he thought was best with the money and the people. When you read word for word what Haman said in the Bible, he made it sound more serious than it was. The Jews were good citizens with no history of causing great harm or threat to the city of Shushan. This is why the people of Shushan were perplexed as to why they would all be annihilated now. The real reason was Haman's pride was hurt because Mordecai did not validate Haman's position of power as he wanted. There is no biblical command against bowing or paying homage to a political leader as a sign of respect. And we see this in Genesis 43 verse 26, where the brothers of Joseph bow down to him. But it was rather a personal choice based on Mordecai's integrity. Haman didn't know this, but, but he interpreted Mordecai's refusal in that way just so he could project his hatred for the Jews and manipulate the king to carry out his plans for wiping them all out of the kingdom. Since the king trusted Haman, since he was his right-hand man, he probably thought that one, it was a small number of people within the kingdom that would be annihilated, and two, that they were highly threatening and dangerous people to the kingdom. When what Haman had done was a pure act of evil, but this plan is what sets God's own plan into full motion. Chapter four. Once Mordecai heard the decree, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and wept loudly and bitterly, and so did the Jews within the Persian Empire as well. When Esther heard that Mordecai was in sackcloth, she was concerned. So she, one, gave him garments to wear, which she refuses to wear, and two, sent one of the king's eunuchs, Hachach, to ask why he was in distress. This is when alongside a copy of the decree, Esther is told for the first time what has just happened. This is when Mordecai tries to persuade her to intercede on behalf of the Jews to save their lives, but she worries that she could be executed for coming before the king without being summoned unless he holds out his golden scepter to show that they may live. It wasn't guaranteed, as she says. I have not been called to go into the king these 30 days, which means she hadn't seen her husband for a month. But King Xerxes, as we've seen with Queen Vashti, did not have a good reputation or history for treating his queens well. So Esther's reaction was very valid, as it was unpredictable what the king's reaction would be. But Mordecai reminded her that she was not excluded from this decree. Even if she didn't rescue the people, he believed that relief and deliverance would arise for the Jews from another place, meaning he had faith in God, not in Esther. But he saw her as the vessel to save the Jews with God's help. And in Esther 4, verse 14, and who knows but that you, to, that you have to your royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai knew that the orphan in exile, who was then promoted to be queen, was not by chance, but was for a purpose. And this is something he wanted Esther to recognize and be encouraged by. This fills her with courage and determination. So following the conversation with Mordecai, she asked for all the Jews to fast and pray for her alongside herself and her maids. For three days and after those three days, She'll go to see the king. She boldly accepts that if she dies, then she dies. But at least she did what she could. Chapter 5. After those three days, Esther puts on her royal robes and goes before the king. Upon seeing Esther, he holds out his golden scepter, demonstrating that he's pleased to see her. And Esther goes near and touches the top of the scepter. The king asked what her request, and she asked 
asked for Haman and himself to come for a banquet that she had prepared. She wanted to gain the confidence of the king first before blurting out her ultimate request right away. The king immediately calls for Haman and the first banquet begins. The king asks her what her request is. She then invites Haman and the king for another banquet the following day where she plans to finally review her ultimate request. It could have been that Esther couldn't find the courage to present her request right away. So inviting them for a second banquet could have been a delaying tactic. I also believe that it was a sign from God that it was not time to reveal the plan and told her to wait just a day longer until God says it was time. Haman, who was in good cheer, leaving the banquet, sees Mordecai, who until this day does not bow to him whatsoever. Haman was full of rage, but he restrained himself, which we can see is the hand of God sparing his people. He went home and called all his friends and wife Suresh to boast about his promotion, his riches, the banquet, and how many children he has. Yet, he was still unhappy. He felt insecure and worthless because of one man's disapproval. This is a great example of how the rewards of this world are not guaranteed to fill the void inside us, but it is for Jesus Christ to fill that void because we are accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 1 verse 6. The problem wasn't Mordecai, but the emptiness of Haman's heart. He thought being respected and honored by everyone was the solution to being happy, but as we can see here, it wasn't exactly working. Turns out his friends and wife Suresh were just as evil as, as they suggested to him to ask for the gallows be made 75 or 25 meters high, 25, sorry, 75 feet in brackets, 25 meters high. And for context, it was a dreadful and painful punishment as the pole goes through your entire body. It was used not just to kill criminals, but to do so publicly to humiliate them. They wanted to do this because just killing Mordecai or the Jews did not satisfy Haman, nor his friends, nor his wife enough. Regardless, the plan pleased Haman, so he had the gallows made. The end of chapter 5 is insightful because it shows how we shouldn't underestimate the hatred within someone's heart. It can cause people to be irrational, violent, and shows how they can go to such extreme lengths to just offend others, thinking that it, is, that it is what will bring them peace, when in reality it does the opposite. So we, especially growing up in church, we're told the story of Esther, but this was even the first time for me to properly read it and to analyze it for myself. And there's this phrase in my mother's language that is like, when, when, when someone has done something so evil that even Satan is not behind it. And that doesn't mean that Satan is not behind an evil action, but it's to emphasize how evil the act is. And I feel that definitely represents Haman in this story. Chapter six. So that night, the king could not sleep. So in the early, morning, early hours of the morning, he commanded for the books of the words, of the records of the chronicles or of his reign to be read to him and which was a book of remembrance, hoping that the reading would make him go to sleep again. The king's servant guessed the part where Mordecai had uncovered the plot, the plot of Bigthana and Teresh, the king's eunuchs, who were doorkeepers, who had plotted to assassinate the king. The king interrupts the king's servant, um, yes, his servant, and asks if Mordecai has received any sort of reward for this. And the king's servant looked within the records and told the king that nothing had been done. It is a bit odd that out of every everything the records held, the king was concerned and zoned in on the fact that Mordecai had not been rewarded as he was only a common subject to the king. He could have ordered any book to be read to him, but he chose the records of the Chronicles, a particular version of the records of the Chronicles. And the king's servant could have started reading from any page, but he started reading from the page which told the story of Mordecai and how he saved the king. As the, sun, as the sun rises the next day, the king notices someone in the outer court and asks who is there. The king's servant tells him that it's Haman, and the king allows him to come in. Bear in mind that Haman had just come 
at the moment that the king was looking for ways to reward Mordecai. Haman enters, and the king asks him, what shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman thinks in his heart, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? It doesn't just say in his head or what, just what he thinks, but it says what Haman was thinking in his heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 to 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. We already know that the guy is evil. We know Haman is evil. But this verse also verifies how all his wicked plans have not just been brainstormed on the spot, but have been produced and have been made from the depths of his heart and has been thought over through over a long period of time. And we see that what, his, what he's thinking within his heart is what reflects in his actions. Haman then answered the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let the royal robe be brought which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on his head. Then let his robe and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most no noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. Then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. The, excla the exclamation mark at the end shows the excitement that he had and that he, how he was explaining how the king should praise the man of honor. We can see Haman was not just asking these things to be done to just anybody, but to himself. This demonstrates his desire to be praised and honored by all to fill his pride. He had no humility whatsoever. Again, he sought man's approval, not God's. And we see as the story progresses, this is linked to Haman's downfall. The king thinks it is a good idea, and he tells Haman to do everything he had just said, but not to Haman, but to Mordecai, and to leave nothing out of his plan. And I feel like it's, it's one of those scenarios in the Bible where you wish you were there to see the expressions on Haman's face as he's explaining everything, and then when the king is like, but for Mordecai, his face just falls. And here we see that God allows proud people to fall into their own traps. Proverbs 26, verse 27, whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and he who rolls a stone will have it rolled back on him. God arranged it so that Haman's pride and arrogance would be the cause of his ultimate humiliation. So Haman, who had no choice, helps Mordecai put on his robe, helps him mount onto the horse, and gives him the royal crest on his head, he leads him through the streets, calling out, Thus shall it be done to the man who the king delights to honor. Afterwards, Mordecai went back to the king's gate, where Haman hurries home to his wife and his friends, mourning with his head covered, while other versions say covering his head as a sign of grief. The definition of grief is intense sorrow, especially caused by someone's death. His reaction is as if someone had died meaning his pride had completely blown and his self-esteem had decreased massively. When he tells his wife and his friends everything, his advisors and wife responded to him saying, if Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. And while they were talking with him, the king's eunuchs came and hired Haman off to the second banquet which Esther had prepared. His advisors and wife could see how things were going to turn out. And the fact that they mentioned Mordecai being of Jewish descent meant that they knew that Mordecai was a man of God and they knew a God existed. And it meant that Mordecai wouldn't prevail himself alone, but his God would prevail over Haman. They acknowledged God's superiority over Haman's human actions that must have killed Haman's confidence even more since his own family and friends did not have faith in him as they once did before chapter 7 now we're at the second banquet 
the banquet of wine, as it was called, where they drank and ate together, the king asked Esther once more what her request was. How Esther answers is tactful, as she asked from a personal point of view, as she already knew that she had already won the favor of the king, and she did not outright say she was a Jew at this point, since Haman also hid the identity of the group he targeted when he made his initial reaction. But she still showed that it was an issue that did not just affect her people, but herself also, emotionally. She answers asking for her life and her people's lives to be spared as they have been singled out to be annihilated alongside their possessions to be destroyed. She goes on to say, if they had been sold into slavery, she would have said nothing, as this matter just would have disturbed the king. But this example shows that what she was requesting to the king wasn't just any problem, just any small problem. But it was a problem where multiple lives were at stake inside of his own kingdom. So it was a justified dilemma to bring before the king. King Xerxes replies, who is he and where is he? Who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? Forgetting that it was he who signed the decree that Haman brought forth to him. To continue reminding ourselves, the word mind isn't mentioned, the word thoughts isn't mentioned, but the word heart is. We see that the book of Esther refers to the heart a lot because God wants to emphasize the point that when we do things, whether it is good or bad, it doesn't just come from our thoughts, but it, but it is rather a reflection of what is in our hearts. Proverbs 4 verse 23, but above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. I like the words Esther uses to describe Haman as she exposes his plan and replies back to the king. The adversary and enemy is the wicked man, Haman. Grammatically, it should be are instead of is. And best believe I was fighting with the word as I was typing this up to keep changing it back to is. But the word is, is emphasizing that it was not either one or the other, but Haman was both. He is many synonyms of an opponent combined. He was an unfaithful servant of the king because he was more interested in his fame and status and he had to be respected. We see him assuming the position of prime minister, not to help others or to serve the king the way Esther and Mordecai had done, but rather to serve himself and himself only. Haman becomes terrified before the king and queen. The clear word Bible says that he couldn't hide his guilt for fear was written all over his face. And to point out here, leading up to chapter seven, there's no sense of remorse or even a feeling of shame that comes from Haman. So it makes me wonder if he was guilty because he didn't know that the queen was also a Jew that he had been caught, or at the time he let the Holy Spirit in and let him know that what he was doing was wrong, but regardless, it was too late. Haman had every right to be terrified because he wasn't just being accused of plotting to kill the Jews in the king's kingdom, but also plotting to kill the king's wife. We now see the significance of Esther inviting Haman to these banquets as it maximized the impact of Haman's wicked plot upon the king and Haman too. The king arose in his wrath and went into the palace garden to gain his composure. The king had, prob had probably had an epiphany that he had just been tricked into bringing a decree into effect that would kill all the Jews, a decree that impacted the Jews heavily and had caused great mourning throughout the city. Haman stands before Queen Esther and pleads for his life, as he already knew what was coming. When the king returns, he sees that Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was, and he is now being accused of assaulting the queen within the king's presence. Things were not looking good for Haman at all, and he was just getting himself into more and more trouble. Just after King Xerxes had shouted in outrage, the eunuchs immediately came and covered Haman's face, meaning they were getting ready for execution. Something to point out here is um, 
even throughout the book of Esther, people who are not Jews and people who had low importance jobs were still mentioned because they still had big roles to play in the story of Esther. We had Haggai, the servant who found favor in Esther, and this foreshadowed that the king would also find favor in her and make her queen, alongside others who found favor in her too. There was Bigdan and Teresh, the king's servant, who plotted to kill the king, and this helped gain Mordecai's favor in the eyes of the king, leading him to be noticed and rewarded. Hachach helped Esther receive the message of the Jews being killed, which kick-started the banquets, and now we have Har Harbona, sorry if I get these names wrong, Harbona, who was also one of the king's servants. And he says to the king, look, the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. Then the king said, hang him on it. My word, sorry, I was annotating it, so my words are a bit all over the place, so bear with me here. Harbona did not just look around and just see the gallows standing there. And we can see this by his word choice, because here how he says, which Haman made for Mordecai, he knew that the gallows were there. Why? Because he knew its original purpose. And here, we see that it was rather brought to mind, meaning that it was at the back of his mind. It wasn't completely forgotten. And here how he says, who spoke good on behalf of the king, who spoke good on the king's behalf. We already know who Mordecai was. This was the same guy that was paraded around, who was paraded around the city. Everyone knew who Mordecai was. We didn't need to you know, state the obvious here. But the king, but the king at this point was, the, of course, equated with Mordecai, which indicated this was God speaking through him to finally bring evil, Haman's evil plan to an end. Psalm 7, verse 16, his trouble shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down in his own, on, own crown. Here we see that Haman had been caught in his trap against Mordecai. In the enduring word commentary, I like the comparison it makes between Haman dying in the place of Mordecai in God's plan succeeding and Satan who thought he had won by getting the crowd to crucify Jesus, but the cross turned out to be the instrument of, Haman, of Satan's defeat. So Haman is hung on the gallows and the king's wrath subsided. Haman's death brought satisfaction and peace to the king. Chapter eight. On the same day Haman was hung, King Xerxes decided to give all of Haman's wealth, including his house to Esther. She finally told the king how she and Mordecai were related. The king was pleased and replaced Haman's position of prime minister with Mordecai. The same signet ring that, king, that the king had given Haman before, he gave to Mordecai, and Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman as well. He gave to Mordecai, oh sorry, everything Haman had worked for, boasted about, and used to fill up his own ego and pride, all left him once he was killed. He didn't have even one thing to pass on to his family. He didn't even leave a good impression or memory of himself to those around him either. Ecclesiastes 12, Ecclesiastes 12 verses 13 to 14, fear God and keep his commandments, for this, is, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. If he had lived a righteous life, God would have gone about his plan differently, but Haman had brought God's fair judgment upon himself and there was no turning back on it. Sometime after that, without being called, Esther goes before the king, falls to her knees and weeps, requesting for Haman's initial decree for the Jews to be killed, for the Jews to be killed, to be repealed. Her coming to the king announced again, unannounced again, and even in her high position of queen, she was down on her knees begging. Shows how much agony she was in, that she couldn't even keep stalling for relief and deliverance from another place, as Mordecai has said to her in chapter four. But we see at this point, she's fully aware of why God had put her in that position. And instead of using it for selfish reasons as Haman did, she used it to be selfless for her people. 
moved with compassion. King Xerxes holds out his scepter to her. Esther rose and stood before the king and asked for Haman's decree to be overruled by new decree. The NIV Bible uses the words, my family, to further emphasize how the Jews were closely related to her and that she could not bear to, to see the destruction of those she loves. But even though Haman was defeated, the decree of the king still stood against the Jews since it could not be repealed. Mordecai was also in his presence, so he responded to both him and Esther's request, saying he had Haman hanged for trying to destroy the Jews. Therefore, whatever pleased Esther and Mordecai, they should order on behalf of the Jews and seal it with a signet ring so it can never be revoked. So the king made another law, giving the Jews the chance to defend themselves against their attackers. So now we'll read verses 9 to 17 together, and I will also say a little bit of each. So the king's scribes were called at the time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day, and it was written according to all, to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews, the satraps, the governors, and the princes of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces in all, to every province in its own script, to every people in their own language, and to the Jews in their own script and language. It emphasizes again how big the kingdom was and how powerful King Xerxes actually was and how far this decree would go. 10. And he wrote in the same name of the King Xerxes and sealed it with, with the king's signet ring and sent letters by couriers on horseback riding on royal horses and horse, horses bred from swift steeds. Yes. Um, and of course, 10 is referring to Mordecai. By these letters, the king permitted the king, the Jews, who were in every city to gather together and protect their lives, to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the forces of any people or province that would assault them, both little children and women, and to plunder their possessions. Both little and women, and we know men is in, the word men is included, but it's, it's not mentioned explicitly here, that they're the most run, vulnerable people in our society. So it was to emphasize that all the Jews had the right and a chance to protect themselves and their families from, destru from destruction. Nobody was excluded from this decree. Verse 12, on one day, in all the provinces of the King Xerxes, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, Although, and this is referring back to when Haman had cast Pur and the day of destruction that had landed on that day. Verse 13, a copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province and published for all people so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. They had a chance to prepare unlike before when they were pretty much hopeless. Esther and Mordecai could have come up with a plan like that before, behind the king's back, instead of going through all the trouble of praying and fasting, coming before the king unannounced, having to hold banquets to stall, instead of saying outright what was their request. But instead, they waited on God's timing. They didn't do what they thought was best in their eyes, including the Jews, but what was best to God. This shows tremendous faith, which even takes us back to our Sabbath school lesson this morning. The faith that they had and how united they were in their decision to wait on the Lord's answer instead of their home, on their own. Because it is human nature when we're in times of trouble to do what we feel is best. But we see here that there's a great example of how they used of how much faith they had in the Lord to wait on his answer, even in such a time of distress. And who knows what further destruction could have happened to the Jews, including Esther and Mordecai, had they done it their own way instead of God's. Verse 14, the couriers who rode on royal horses went out, hastened, and pressed on by the king's command, and a decree was issued in Shushan the citadel. So we see that it was urgent, and all the Jews needed to to know as soon as so they could prepare in time. 
Verse 15, so Mordecai went from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold and, and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. I find this part of the story quite emotional and beautiful because we see that it wasn't just a win for Mordecai, but it was a win for all the Jews in the kingdom. Verse 16, the Jews had light and gladness joy and honor. The same can be applied to how we view the second coming. Our salvation is not yet complete, yet we can rejoice because of our confidence in our king. Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Verse 17, and in every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. Then many of the people of the land became Jews because, because fear of the Jews fell upon them. When the non-believers saw how the Lord had been working for the Jews, this attracted them to seek to have the same relationship with God the way the Jews did. Second to last chapter, guys, just, just hold on. <laughs> chapter nine. Now in the 12th month of Adar, on the 13th day, the time came for the king's command and his decree to take place. On the day that the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, the opposite occurred, in that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. This was because they knew they had God on their side. Romans 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? The Jews gathered together in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Xerxes to lay hands on those who sought their harm, and no one could withstand with, could stand them because fear of them fought, or fear of them fell upon all people. And all the officials of the provinces, the sashaps, the governors, and all those doing the king's work helped the Jews because they respected Mordecai. Mordecai was great in the king's palace, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man, Mordecai became increasingly prominent. So the Jews defeated all their enemies with one stroke of the sword, slaughtering many of their Jews, and they proceeded to do whatever they pleased with them. In Shushan, the citadel, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and from, forgive my pronunciation, also Parshadatha, Dauphon, Aspatha, Paratha, Adalia, Aridatha, Parmashta, Arasai, Aridai, and Vajasatha. And Va Vajasatha. And I thought it was important to say all the cities because it was again to emphasize how big the kingdom was and how many Jews' lives were at stake. The 10 sons of Haman, the son of Ham Hamadatha, who was also enemies of the Jews, was killed, were killed. But the Jews did not take nor destroy any of their enemies' possessions. In Haman's original plan, the enemies were to destroy the Jews and take their possessions. And we see that in the latest decree, the Jews had that same right to do as well. But we see that even though the Jews wiped out the nations who were against them, they didn't take their possessions, even though the decree allowed them to defend themselves as they chose not to. So even as they were slaying the enemies, they still had mercy and grace upon them. On that day, the number of those who were killed in Shushan, the citadel, was brought to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the citadel, and the 10 sons of Haman, what have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. Or what is your further request? It shall be done. Then Esther said, if it pleases the king, let it be granted to the Jews who are in the Shushan to do again tomorrow according to the day's decree, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. The decree was issued in Shushan and they hanged Haman's ten sons. One can argue that Esther showed a lack of of love towards their enemies, as even the Bible teaches us to love our enemies too. Yet she displayed the same principle found often in Joshua. She would not settle for less than a complete victory. Saul in chapter one of Sam, of first Sam, I think it's first Samuel, was commanded by God to destroy all the um, Amal Amalekites, there you go, whom Haman had descended from as the king of the Amalekites was called Agag. 
And in chapter three of Esther, Haman is introduced as an Agagite, meaning Saul failed and spared the Agagite king instead of killing himself as God commanded. Of killing him, sorry, as God commanded. But we see the victory has been restored through Mordecai and Esther. And the Jews who were in Shushan gathered together again on the 14th day of the month of Adar and killed 300 men at Shushan, but they did not rob nor destroy their possessions. The rest of the Jews in the king's provinces gathered, but once again they did not rob nor destroy their possessions. This was done on the 13th day of the month Adar. And on the 14th day of the month, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day as well as the 14th day and on the 15th of that month. They rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who dwelt in the city celebrating the 14th day of the month of Ada with gladness and feasting as a holiday and for sending presents to one another. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Xerxes to establish among them that they should celebrate yearly the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the days on which the Jews had rest from their enemies and that they should make them days of feasting and joy and of sending presents to one another in gifts to the poor so they can continue to remember what God did for them and celebrate their great win, but at the same time help others too in the process as God did for them. So the Jews accepted the custom which they had begun, so Mordecai had written to them, as Mordecai had written to them. The name um, originates from the word per, the lot that Haman had cast, as the celebration is called Purim, and we see this is a full circle moment. The Jews established and imposed it upon themselves and their descendants and all who would join them that without missing even one year, they should celebrate these two days every year and that it should be kept throughout every generation, every family, every province and every city for all the Jews and people who, and people who become a Jew and that the feast should never be forgotten by the people to come. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihail, with Mordecai the Jew, who was her cousin, wrote with the full authority to confirm the second letter about Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Xerxes with words of peace and truth to confirm these days of Purim at their appointed time as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had written and commanded them to do. So the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim and it was written in the book. Purim has been followed and kept, and is said to be one of the most popular feasts that the Jewish still celebrate today, which takes us to our last chapter that we shall read all together. And King Xerxes imposed tribute on the land and on the islands of the sea. Now, now all the acts of his power and his might and the account of the greatness of Mordecai, to which the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Merdi and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second to King Xerxes and was great among the Jews and well received by the multitude of his brethren, seeking the good of his people and spe seek speaking peace to all his countrymen. Two quotes from Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who was an English particular Baptist preacher, to conclude the story of Esther. It has been well said that the book of Esther is a record of wonders without a miracle, and therefore Though equally revealing the glory of, of the Lord, it sets it forth in another fashion from that which is displayed in the overthrow of Pharaoh by miraculous power. Last of all, let each child of God rejoice that we have a guardian so near the throne. Every Jew in Shushan must have felt hope when he remembered that the queen was a Jew. Today, let us be glad that Jesus is exalted. To conclude, Esther teaches us that all have, we all have a part to pay, play in God's plan. Even the ungodly have a part to play in his plan. And that wherever we are, we are there for a purpose. It is for us to use the help of God to help us in making his plan succeed. And that trials we face in this life are all a part of his plan too. For us to become stronger, more resilient, it helps us to learn to persevere, to trust, and have faith in him and not in ourselves. And this is how we can minister to others as well. And in the beginning, I'd asked how did Esther navigate an ungodly world as a godly woman? 
The answer is, is that our actions speak for themselves and that they are louder than our words. God is not mentioned even once in the book of Esther, but we see that he is working and active behind the scenes. We see how Esther, Mordecai, and the Jews went about protecting themselves. And this spoke a lot about their love, hope, and trust in God. And with everything combined, we see how his plans were able to prevail in the end. May God bless his message.